I think I'm live. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Becky Goldsmith, and thank you for joining me today and taking a time out. Um, I, I almost missed it because I was working on what I'm going to do next week, which I'll tell you about at the end. So, yes, once again behind me is Birds in Toyland. You know what? That class starts tomorrow, class number four. Uh, there's still time to sign up. We haven't started yet. Uh, you can find the sign up at Creative Spark Online, and there are links on my um, links on my website. Uh, let me think. What else? I think that's enough about that. I've talked to you about it before. So let me tell you about today. Did you notice it's the same quilt behind me, but the other colorway? This one is more wool. Just saying. Okay, so today I'm going to show you how to make one of those cooling scarves. You know the things, we've all seen them, that you soak in water and then you can wear around your neck and they stay moist long enough to keep you cool. Now the reason I'm doing this is because a friend of mine and a friend of Lorna's, her name is Sarah Myers, she was making these to donate to a relief effort in Louisiana. And then that relief effort, I don't know, her sources, they got overwhelmed. And so I'm not entirely sure. I don't have a relief effort to plug you into. That said, these are pretty nice. And I have, as I was making these, thinking of all the places, even in town locally, that could use them. Okay, so let me show you what. Now this first bit is as much an excuse to share with those of you who've wanted a little, some tips on rotary cutting. This first bit is tips on rotary cutting. Is it going? I have already taken my fabric and lined it up at the selvages and held it up to make sure that when it hangs, it's flat down below. Let me double check this again. All right, there we go. My fabric is flat on my cutting mat, and I like the tools from Quilters Select. I like the mat, I like the rulers and the way they grip the fabric, and I love my uh, rotary cutter. It's heavier than most, and it's got a really great grip, I love this cutter. Place one of the lines on the ruler over the folded edge and get it all lined up. And mine needs work here. I often use the dashed lines rather than the solid lines because I can see through the ruler better. I'm looking here and then I will turn my attention to this raw edge. And I'll lose some because it's really rare that those edges line up perfectly. When you hold your fabric by the selvage and straighten it out so that it hangs tidy, you almost always lose some off to the edge. When you cut, hold the rotary cutter so that the blade is absolutely perpendicular to the mat. You don't want it angling either direction. Now, this rotary cutter is one that I can hold down the little button, tap it, and then that disengages the safety. Hold the ruler firmly with your hands. Keep your fingers away from the edge where the cut's going to happen because you can really hurt yourself. Sometimes I'll lay my hands flat. Usually I think I'm up more on my fingertips. Place the flat edge of the blade against the right edge, if you're right-handed, of the ruler. Don't try cutting on the guard side. Lean into it, cut, and then shift your hand as needed to finish the cut. Once your cut is made, remove this. I want to cut a 5-inch strip selvage to selvage. 
and I don't want to be cutting backwards against the ruler and I'm at a table where I can't walk to the other side. This is a trick. What I'm going to do is carefully pick this ruler up and move that to the 5 inch mark. And then I'm going to take a second ruler and this is where having these particular tools is helpful because I can hold this, I can hold the ruler on the fabric firmly and it will slide against this mat just a little bit. But I can also hold that in place and this isn't going to move because it's gripping the fabric. I can hold that, I can work this ruler in position, hold this ruler lift that up and now I can cut again on the right side of the ruler. This is a trick that I use pretty often. Yeah, I do because my cutting table is bumped over against the wall. I can't get around it usually. Some things. Did you notice my tattoo? It, it, it showed up. You don't see it very often. It's kind of hidden on my arm, but it does show up sometimes on, online. Remember, I got this tattoo a few weeks ago. Anyway, so there's that. Then the other thing is that I know a lot of people like to cut on a higher table because it saves your back. You're not leaning over as much. I actually prefer to cut at a like a tabletop height, which is lower because I can lean into it more. Now that said, I am careful to keep my core, my abdominals engaged. I zip them up so that my lower back is supported as I lean forward and cut. Because if you let your low back go, yeah, yeah, it's going to it's going to make you sore before too long. Uh, the other thing, the Quilter Select ruler and mat. They are designed to work together. So not just any mat works quite as well with that ruler because the Quilter Select mat, front and back, it's two-sided, is a little smooth, not as textured as some of the other mats. And the ruler grips well enough that if you put your weight into it, you can shift the fabric you're holding with the ruler. Now, what I was doing today, it really didn't matter. But there are times where you want to hold the thing you've just cut and shift it. And you can do that with this. It's really, really nice. And the rulers come in a variety of sizes. I, on the website, have the cutters. And I have replacement blades. Their blades are good. Um, I don't sell the mat and the rulers because they're too hard for me to ship. But if you can't find them locally, I can darn sure hook you up with where to find them. Just email me and I'll, and Lorna, or email Lorna, she'll tell you where. Uh, so you start to make one of the cooling scarves with a five inch wide strip cut selvage to selvage. The ends are going to be cut at a 45 degree angle. You can round them if you like, but 45 degrees seems faster to me. So. I will want the point to be on the folded edge. I'm going to take the ruler and line up the 45 degree line with that raw edge. And I'm going to cut that off. And here's the other end. I'm going to do the same thing on this end. I'm going to press a hem into one end before I sew because I think that's going to make it easier to sew together when it's all said and done. So I've pressed that with my little wooden tool. You could also take it to the ironing board and press it and I may do that before I sew. Yeah, I took it to the ironing board and did it with my real iron. And preparing that end with the folded under hem, I ironed, folded and ironed, really does make closing that end much easier when you're 
at the very end of making the, the cooling scarf. Okay, so let's see, what's the next thing? Oh, the next video is the sewing and turning. And, and there's a tool I use in the turning that some of you may know because it's a really old tool. But if you've never seen it happen, this is a really dandy little tool. I began sewing at this end, followed the long edge using a quarter inch seam allowance, and I brought these edges together all the way to the end. I sewed to there even though I did press this under. Now I want to turn the tube right side out. And you know what? There's a tool for this. I've had this thing for years. It's called a bow whip. And when I say for years, I, I may have had this for 25 years. And what it is is a series of tubes, smaller sizes in there. You put the tube down in the thing, and then you use the appropriate size tool to feed that through. Can I just say the bow whip is a wonderful tool. So there's that. I can take that out. There's my dowel. And I can feed this down. And then with the dowel still in there, I can work that point out. And I could feed a smaller tool inside there as well if I needed to. And I can use this, interestingly enough, as I bring it out of the tube to help flatten the thing out. Next, I'll take this to my actual ironing board over there where my iron is and press it flat, keeping the seam on one side and the fold on the other. I'm pressed and I've decided I'm not going to add top stitching, but you could. I wanted to show you that on this end where I folded it in, I'm really glad I did that because it's going to make it easy to sew this up. But if you sew all the way to that raw edge, and I'm not unhappy that I did, when you turn that under, that seam kind of sticks out. But I think it leaves a very secure end, so I would do that but I just wanted you to know that that's what will happen. Next, let's find center. Fold it in half to find center. So center is right there. I'm going to finger press that. And then I'm going to place my six inch ruler with the three inch line right there. And I want to mark here and here and then move to one side and reposition the ruler and mark here and the other side. and mark there. Choose the line that is farthest from your open side. So go open side all the way down and sew a line all the way across this because inside each one of these pockets is where you will put the water beads. I'm going to go sew that and then I'll be back. Okay, two things. <laughs> the, the bow whip, that really is the original packaging, and it cracks me up that I've still got it, but where else would I put it? And I have no idea why they call this a bow whip. Makes no sense to me. Um, this is a tool, it's probably online called a tube turner. And let's face it, you can find these on Amazon and it's going to be probably easier than me stocking them in there because this is not a tool I use in applique or my hand sewing very often. But for those of you who don't have one of these, dandy. Uh, the other thing, 
the next thing. What goes in the scarf to make it be a cooling scarf are these things. Now, they have been around. Water beads have apparently been around a really long time. I don't know where I've been. I'd never heard of them before. But Sarah gave me this tiny little bag, and the bag she bought, she said, was much bigger. But you only use, let's see, this has, you won't even end up using a tablespoon of these in your scarf. So I did a science experiment because I wanted to see what these do in water. That's what's next. I did an experiment before I started this. I want to share it with you. That is the head of a three-quarter inch clover sequin pin. The water bead is a little bigger than that. That is one water bead that sat in water for a few hours. But it got to that size pretty quickly. That's why you don't need very many of these inside each one of the pockets. Oh, oh, look what happens. When it crushes, it does that. So they're a little bit fragile once they're full of water. That's important to keep in mind um, when, when you're handling one of these yourself. I'll have to double check on the packaging. It's possible that they don't recommend that you get the water beads quite that full of water. Okay, you don't see my face here, which is fine. I did Google after I did the science experiment because I wondered what these things are made from. Well, they're made from a super absorbent polymer. Okay, that told me that. And then I got to wondering, are they biodegradable? So <laughs> there are two answers to that. Um, the, the, the one place I found said, no, they are not fully biodegradable. But then the next, the next thing I found, and this might have been Wikipedia or it was another product kind of thing, says, Yes, they are biodegradable. Where does it say that? Uh, they are non-toxic and reusable, and they do biodegrade over time, which actually coincides with what I thought because of the way they broke up. That said, they're a polymer. So, you know, that part's up in the air. But they don't stay hard little beads in the way some other things do, depending on, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm guessing. I've got two answers for you right there. Then they are non-toxic, but here's the deal. You should never, ever, ever swallow these because inside of your body is moist and these things suck up the moisture and expand. If you swallow these or a little child swallows them, it is not going to be a good idea. So they may be non-toxic, but you don't eat them ever. Uh, so you'd want to be careful where you store these and maybe um, <laughs> put a note on them. This is be sure not to eat them. But then the question was, how long do you soak them? Two or three hours which is cool. At the very, very end, I'll show you what it looks like after you've soaked it for two hours. Uh, so that was the science experiment, talking to you about what water beads are that I'm about to show you what you're doing with them next. Because the water beads are so little and tiny, I'm going to fold a piece of, this is cardstock, but I'm going to fold a piece of paper to put below it while I work. This is the bag of beads that Sarah gave me. And she says you take a quarter of a teaspoon only of beads and pour it down in there and get them to feed all the way to the bottom. I'm going to share a trick with you. Rather than working over my folded paper, which seemed like a really good idea in case things fell out, 
the beads drop better into the tube if you hold it open and then hold this like over the floor so that the tube can drop nice and long in a straight line and then you drop the beads in they go more quickly down into the pocket than they do if you start with the thing on a table. So I've worked my way getting those beads to fall to the bottom and there they are. Now I'm going to repeat. I'm going to sew the next line, drop in another quarter teaspoon of water beads, sew the next line, drop in a quarter teaspoon more, and sew that line. I'll be back. So you're only going to use three quarters of a teaspoon of water beads for every scarf. That's not very many. Uh, the other thing with the folded paper, you know, that's the trick you do if you're working with little tiny things like beads or sequins. And then if the beads or the sequins happen to spill out and fall on the paper, if it's already creased, you can pick the paper up and dump whatever little tiny thing is back into its packaging. I really did think I would have that problem with the water beads, but turns out I didn't have the problem at all. Uh, so, oh, the other thing I wanted to remember to tell you, you could make multiples of these at once pretty easily. The pressing, the sewing, all of that, you could do, you know, 10 at a time, 20 at a time, and even the marking of them. If you fold and find center on one and lay that out on your mat, and then you line up several next to it, you can use a, a ruler and mark across several at once, um, marking your lines for sewing. I didn't want to forget that. Uh, okay, next up, let's see here. There it is. So here's my finished tie. I've got this leading edge that can act as a tie, one pocket with beads, another pocket with beads, another pocket with beads, and then the other end, that's the other end of the tie, I top stitched this end closed. And having that pressed under in advance really did make that part very quick and easy. This is a really nifty little project. Yeah, it is. It was really fast. Now, I want to show you because at noon, two hours ago, I got my Pyrex bowl and I put... I put water in it about, about to here. How much would that be? Maybe a cup, cup and a half of water. And I put this finished scarf in there. And it's funny because I've got, really, I've got a for real green screen behind me. So the color on this is going to be all weird. But I want you to see how, see how giant full these things are it's it's really full so because the beads will squash broken you would not want to take this and wring it out however this the tie end I've got a towel underneath me just so you know I'm wringing that out and I might if I wanted to I could get a little excess water off of that with the tie holy cow that's cold <laughs> I, I, I wasn't exactly ready for that. I don't know why. I'm going to get the top of my, my garment all wet. So you can tie it with these empty ties. You could also take those and wrap them around your neck and tie in the back. My husband, my darling husband, who works outside in the heat a lot um, when it's hot, he wants one of these. And he takes students out in the field because he's a field biologist and it has been hot here. It's still hot in Texas. I'm going to make several for him to give to his students. Think about kids at grade school who are who are working at field day when it's so hot. There's a lot of places where these would be really handy. Now I will tell you that you can buy cooling scarves online and they're not exactly that expensive. However, the fabric they're made from 
is not nearly as cute <laughs> as the fabric we've got. And especially if you've got a lot of fabric in your stash, you've weeded out, you don't exactly know what to do with it. These are nice. And it's possible that, say, your fire departments, your local fire departments, your local police stations, if you took them in and just gave them a bag and said, would you like these? They really might. Uh, if you go online and look for the care and feeding instructions on these, they'll tell you it's better to soak maybe in distilled water than regular water. I'm not going to do that. Bottled water might be good. Uh, or just tap water. Your tap water is clean out of the faucet. You can, when you let these really dry, the beads will desiccate again. They're supposed to go back to their regular size. So as long as you don't pack them up inside a Ziploc bag when they're wet, when they might get moldy, I think this has a pretty decent lifespan ahead of it. Fun, right? <laughs> Okay, so if you, ha oh yeah, the top of my dress is, it's damp. Um, if you have questions that you would like me to address on timeout, please do send me an email at becky.pieceofcake at gmail.com um, because I'm right here almost all the time. Now, next week, I told you I'm working on what I want to do next week. I have gotten interested in thinking about embroidery in not just an abstract way, but actually doing some more embroidery than I typically do. So I'm going to do a cat pillow with embroidery. And I have a feeling that this is going to be more than just a one week thing. So I think if I can pull myself together, beginning next week, we're gonna start a little project. Uh, I think that's what I'm gonna do. I'm not going to promise for real for true, but that is my very strong plan. If you're interested in doing this uh, and you have a pet you would like to put, say, on a pillow, get a good picture. Get a good picture of your pet and I will walk you through, I'm pretty sure, some of the steps that will help you generate your own line art to make your pattern. And I'll share the one I've got with you. Lorna has ideas for how we can do this. So that's that's what I got. And I thank you guys for joining me. Thank you so much for being with me this week and every other week. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoy making some cooling scarves. And until I see you again, may you have many happy stitches. <laughs>